Hello, everyone. We're back. Dr. Nirmal Das and myself, John Coleman, on Christian history and ideas. Welcome, Nirmal. Welcome, John. Great to be here. This episode, we're going to reprise our topic from a few weeks back. That is the development of modernity, as well as the stresses and uh, distortions and uh, difficulties this, this created amongst the Catholic people as we're entering the 20th century. Before we reprise this huge topic, this is just a survey of it, of course, uh, we have received some viewer correspondence, and we want to get into that now. Of course, we always recommend and welcome uh, comments and questions, suggestions about topics, and all this good stuff, both in the uh, um, uh, comment section to these videos on BitChute, as well as YouTube, as well as to be sent to Christian History and Ideas at gmail.com. Now, Nirmal, you're the um, you're the uh, the collector of the questions there. So, what's the first uh, one that we have? Uh, yes, we got the first one was a discussion of the Christian origins of Islam would be um, uh, would be an interesting topic. And indeed, it would be. I think you have some um, background there yourself, Nirmal. Yes, I would love to talk about that, and it could it would be an extensive, um, you know, uh, discussion. I.e., I'm thinking that it might stretch out to two or three, you know, um, perhaps more, <laughs> uh, because it's such a vast topic. But it's a very interesting one, and it's worth exploring because it helps us understand um, where um, Islam is to be located um, in the in the you know. Uh, cosmology of religions, is world religions as such. And uh, I think uh, we can make a good case that it's a Christian uh, heresy. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in Islam myself and have been for a number of years, it's history and, and so forth. And uh, I, can, I can guarantee you that, that Nirmal and I will give you a better, um, a better treatment than um, Allah's the moon god or whatever they... Uh... Whatever that is, yes. All that silliness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, yeah, that's a great topic, and and that's a fine suggestion. Yes. Um, what else, Nirmal, do we have? Um, whether we will be reading uh, the new book by uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones, and whether a joint interview could be possible. <laughs> well, if I can get my hands on the book, uh, money is tight these days, but I'm, I'm certainly open to reading Dr. Jones's material. I, obviously, I've interviewed him on my um, my show, uh, a conversation with, as Nirmal and I were first introduced through that media. Um, but Dr. Jones is certainly erudite, and um, I've had the occasion, besides the interview, to meet him years ago um, over in New York, across the border. And... Um, he has many, many uh, intriguing ideas, and um, he has a bit of vinegar to him, which I think we can use uh, betimes. So there's uh, there's a lot to recommend him. And um, this idea of logos, which is um, obviously it's ancient, it's St. John's phraseology, but it's something Dr. Jones has revived in his latest text. And it's something I'm, I'm you know happy to hear is being um, brought about, and a lot of people are enthusiastically... Uh, embracing that concept and um, you know that that popularization I think has to do at least online with Dr. Jones so I'm definitely open to those suggestions. Yeah that would be a great idea I think he's doing great work yeah for sure. Um, uh, the next question is um, what to do with pagan stories that give strength to um, uh, to readers? Uh, Tor in um, Jotunheim or uh, they say in Old Norse Jotunheim um, it inspires me. Um, did you want us to comment on that, or? Well, I mean, I, I certainly, um, I've been inspired by certain, you know, stories in, in pagan mythology. I think the Celtic mythology of, of, um, I, I suppose, the Norse as well of uh, the gods fighting the universe, even though they know they're going to, to be destroyed. I, the, there's something to that. Of course, we're recording this on the 104th anniversary of the Easter Rising, and that mythology of. The Celtic mythology definitely played a role in um, 
and the, the poets and playwrights who, who led that insurrection. So, I mean, I, I tip my hat um, to the inspiration of certain um, aspects of these mythologies. And and it's an aspect I we can get into it in our, our main discussion today. I think we've lost in, in Christianity this idea of a guiding story that we can plug our lives into. So I certainly understand the attraction of um of these stories and taken uh, just as stories there's there's um nothing wrong you know nothing wrong with that um but as we're going to get into today there's there's much more in christianity besides just um abstract stories although i i i am sensitive to you know, just the the power of the naked story itself to move someone and that aspect. But there is there's a more physic physical and historical relationship that I I believe Christianity offers. So I'm sympathetic to that conclusion. Um, but I'd like to hear what Nirmala you think about that query. Sure. Yes. Um, like you, I am a great reader of Old Norse um, and um, the stories of the Vikings. In fact, uh, I like it so much that I learned the language. Uh, so, and I'm now translating uh, one of the more obscure um, sagas, um, which has now been translated before, I think. Um, so, yes, um, and for example, uh, uh, just to uh, point this out, it's a great book, um, a very old one. Um, what do we have there? This is the Viking Society. I don't know if you read it. You can, um, can you um, angle it in such a way that the light doesn't uh -huh. shine through it? There we go. Then, Viking Society, Volume Two. Yeah. And who's that by is, on your mouth? This is the Elder Edda, which is a which is a collection of poetry, old Norse poetry, relating to the deeds of the gods. So you have Woden or Odin, uh, you have Thor, you have Baldur, uh, Freya, Frigg, Loki, all these characters uh, doing their things that they do. Uh, and so yeah, they're a great fun to read. Um, and I would encourage lots of people to read this stuff um, and even learn the language. Uh, Old Norse is a fascinating language. Um, I really like it. Um, I got into it after I learned Old English uh, because Old English you know, or Anglo-Saxon and Old Norse are very closely related. So it's a natural, they push, when you're learning Old English, they kind of push you into learning Old Norse as well. Uh, it's like Greek and Latin thing, you know, if you learn Latin, you kind of are pushed into Greek. Um, so anyway, um, so yes, these stories have much to offer us. Um, inspiration for sure. I liked reading them. I get inspired by them too, and, it's, and they're great fun to read. Um, but my point here is that <clears throat> inspiration often is not enough. We need more. Um, and this is uh, something that um, the Viking society or Old Norse society also recognized, uh, that they're um traditions their religion their faith systems uh were limited um and therefore christianity offered them that which they didn't have hope um uh, there's a very famous um story about that um in uh when you know when the uh, first missionaries went into england to convert uh the anglo-saxons the poor pagan um and in one of the settings um and the story gets, you know, so it's hard to pin down where it actually occurred because it occurs with different kings. But anyway, we'll just say one Anglo-Saxon king summoned um, uh, Christian missionaries into his hall and they told him, explained to him. And then there was a meeting as to what to do and there was a vote. And one of the thanes, uh, retainers of the king, stood up and said, you know, um, what we know about life is like a sparrow coming into a brightly lit hall out of the darkness. It stays for a little while, enjoys the warmth and the music and the fire, and then it flies out into the darkness. This is all we know. And if their faith can tell us more about what is going on with life or what is outside, uh, beyond the hall, then I think we should become Christians. And that was, you know, that was um, the the uh, the most, uh, uh, I guess, uh, convincing argument that the Germanic world, the Old Norse, the Viking world, the pagan world could could come up with, is that it could only enjoy the warmth of the hall. It didn't know what happened afterwards or what happened before, <clears throat> and those were the important questions for them that they couldn't resolve with their own mythologies. So, these stories are wonderful but they're limited. Um, 
and the, and because they're limited, they can only lead us that far or offer us that much. Um, so I read them uh, like you know everyone else for enjoyment, inspiration, and just fun. Um, and I, I guess scholarly as well pursued uh, because I, I I am interested in in the culture in Viking culture in old Germanic culture. Um, and this can be traced in different ways as well. You know, uh, Germanic culture in in old, in Anglo-Saxon and um, in um, old Franconian, um, or you know, uh, old Saxon and so forth. These other manifestations they're not as extensive, uh, but it can be all traced out. But it all comes down to this: they have a very limited worldview, and that limitation is something that haunts them uh, throughout because they're caught. They're as culturally, they've painted themselves into a corner. I know I'm rambling, but um, they've counted. You know, they've uh, um, they've painted themselves into a corner from which they don't know how to get out. So Germanic culture by this time is rooted in um, um, revenge, in blood culture, uh, in Wiergeld, uh, as they call it, man price price for. So if you can kill a man, you can pay money and you're fine. This sets off an entire culture of revenge killings um, and so forth. And they don't know how to get out of it. Uh, they try, they don't know how to get out of the violence. And Christianity offers them the hope of getting out of this, this dead end that they've created for themselves. So the point is, cultures can create dead ends. Unfortunately, the old pagan culture created for itself a dead end. And it didn't know how to resolve it. And Christianity was the only resolution that they had. And they took it. As we were um, discovering last episode, Nirmal, I think one of the dynamics that we're, we're facing in the West now to understand the revitalization of uh, paganism um, and Gnosticism and so forth is that this modern culture has painted itself into even more of a dead end. And because of that, things like Thor and Jutenheim or Kilcoten or Osiris or whatever, they are providing people substantively more than dead end commerce and secularism are. And that's the danger is people are going just to end up in the stories and they're not going to be like that bird and, and, and look beyond it. Exactly, exactly. And the danger then becomes is that uh, we become, uh, we try to answer the dead end with another dead end. Um, where, you know, and then that leads us nowhere spiritually, i.e. these stories or these tales and these myths or whatever you might want to, want to call them are particular in a time space. And let's not also forget um, that the people who preserved them were Christians. So the yeah. only reason we have, you know, Kukulin uh, in, in Old Norse or, you know, Tain Bokuli in, um, you know, the old Irish myths, um, you know, Battle Raid of Cooley, very famous, beautiful uh, poem. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the Book of the Red uh, Dun Cow uh, in, in Old Irish, uh, or the, the, you know, the, the, the sagas, the, the Kvitha, the Tatar, all of these um, ancient Germanic and Celtic uh, literatures and traditions only come down to us because they were preserved by the church. The monasteries recognized importance and value in these tales and legends and stories um, and preserve them. So what we have really are very distinct monastic efforts to, to, to uh, uh, preserve something that was dead and dying. Uh, so we wouldn't know about Odin and Kukulen and uh, so forth if we didn't have the monasteries and the monks who took the effort to record all this stuff. Um, and because of that, we can then, of course, uh, you know, do what we do and, uh, you know, share them as a etc. So the point is that it's a living culture that is preserving the dead end culture. I think that dynamic we must not lose sight of. Uh, and this happens throughout Europe. It's not just uh, in, in Anglo-Saxon England or in Scandinavia or in Ireland, but in other parts of Europe as well, uh, in Russia, for example, and so forth. Um, the preservers of the old traditions, the old religion, we say, is the church. 
uh, is the mon monastic tradition that preserves them because that's where the learning is because these people don't have writing. And I think that's a great transition point there, Nirmal. So uh, before I, I make that point or we jump back into our main uh, discussion, um, I do want to thank the viewers who contributed those questions and comments. So much food for thought there and, and perhaps some ammo for future future shows. I think each of these shows comes up with like 10 more uh, <laughs> 10 more topics or whatever, but that's great. And we welcome that correspondence. That's a great thing. Thank you so much, viewers. Um, but one of the great transition points I think that this makes is um, uh, something that we were discerning last uh, episode near Mal. We're going to see it this one. It's something I've expressed in our own correspondence between each other. And that's my dismay um, as the 20th century wore along into the 20th first is of observant creedal orthodox and and pious catholics who have over the over the decades because of the stresses of of this society take on an, a rather ham-fisted approach to things and i remember uh, with the the explicit um topic of mythology came up and this is our jumping off point as we're going to resume at the 20th century um, but when I was in um, Ridgefield teaching at a school by a certain uh, well-known French uh, traditionalist order, um, this was exactly one of the things that caused a blow up. And this is the type of ham-fistedness we see developing over the 20th century. And I know this exact topic happened in St. Mary's, Kansas as well. And that was the teaching of mythology. And um, because it's a sensitive topic, um, you know, what's called perennialism or the deeper truths in non-Christian religions over time, but it's, it's not a forbidden topic. And the church fathers were very, very aware of the deeper mythological realities in, in, in paganisms. We've lost that today. So what we have now are a bunch of mothers sending around these quotes allegedly from St. Basil about why you shouldn't read the, you know, the pagan mythologies. And I thought cause this was a blow up that ha happened in my career elsewhere. The, the, the parents were so shell-shocked because of the culture. They heard that, you know, their kids are reading mythology and they panicked. And it's this type of ham-fistedness that we see develop. So um, I don't know if you had thoughts there or we can jump in at the beginning of, of the 1900s. No, that's a great, actually, it's, a, it's going to be a nice segue into our this main discussion. Uh, you're right, it, this ham-fistedness, as you describe it very aptly, uh, is a serious problem. Because what we have is a corruption of what um, knowledge is all about. Um, and this problem of uh, being fearful of other types of knowledge that exists um, in the world is a very particular modernist problem. Um, when, for example, the, the missionaries were going out and converting the pagans, say Vikings or whatnot, they weren't concerned about this sort of thing. Uh, they weren't really concerned about uh, the problems this could create. Um, uh, I think there is that very, very famous um, um, quotation uh, in one of the sermons by Saint. Uh, I think it's Saint Anselm, if I'm not correct, men, uh, men, remembering cor correctly, in which he's 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 complaining that the monks are way too involved in preserving these ancient stories and texts, and he and he's and he asks this pertinent question: What does Ingeld have to do with Christ? Ingeld is one of the Germanic heroes. Um, and what does Ingeld have to do with Christ? Uh, so I think we're getting a version of that here. But whereas um, that question was resolved in that these stories provide some kind of, um, well, for lack of a better term, information as well as enjoyment, um, in that there is some value to them. And there's no, the question of fear doesn't exist, of course. It's just, you guys are spending way too much time talking about Ingeld, uh, you know, as opposed to uh, what you should be doing, uh, rather than saying this is going to corrupt us, that this is going to somehow lead us into becoming pagans. So this idea, and I think this is a very modern idea, that certain kind of texts are corruptive uh, and therefore are to be avoided or burned or censored or destroyed and so forth. Um, and this is the problem, of course, what we're talking about is, is the latest manifestation, this idea of fake news, you know, that certain news is to be trusted and some, certain trees is not to be trusted. It's the same problem that we're talking about. This, this is the parameters we shift about. 
uh, it's the same problem. What does Ingold have to do with Christ? This is the problem. This is the truth. Why do you want to look at Tor and Kukulin and all this sort of thing? No, this is not what this is all about. Rather, what we're really talking about is that uh, these ancient traditions or so forth were also striving towards something. They never managed to find it, but in that striving, they show us what the greater uh, truth is all about. I.e., they got that far, but they couldn't get any further, and they needed help, and help was available to them. Um, and that help was Christianity. Um, and what has happened to that question and to that approach is that it has now become a matter of fear. And this is a very modern approach to things, i.e., I have the truth, and I'm going to hang on to it. Uh, and if you try to question my truth, you're going to be, you know, labeled such and such, or I'm going to create fear, fear mongering, basically. Um, and it's that fearful approach to knowledge that I think is more harmful than diversity of knowledge of saying, you know, things are what they are. There was a world before Christianity, and we have to deal with it. Um, and we deal with it in this way, by preserving it, by learning it, by enjoying it. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it doesn't, you know, mean that we've suddenly become pagans just because I, you know, like I said before, just because I like reading Homer doesn't mean I go around worshiping Zeus. Um, and, you know, it's not these the the connections aren't there at all. But to formulate the questions or to con or to say there is a connection, I think, is is a fault of ours, i.e., that we become so, you know, blinded or or limited in our vision that we cannot differentiate between what we have and what existed before. And when we left off last conversation, Nirmal, we found the uh, the faithful population in the West <clears throat> um, at, at very much a, uh, a crossroads um, with, with um, in this case, grade school education, where they were damned if they do, damned if they don't. Right? If the bishops were to forbid the... Um, the, the children from going to the state schools altogether, um, then it would have, in a sense, given fuel to the uh, the fire there of um, of the Enlightenment claim that Christianity was uh, corrupting and was stultifying, but also there the the idea that if an authentic historical Christianity was also um, taught in the schools, if it was taught in the schools in its truly traditional way, the it would have been so different from the mainstream schools that the it, it would have also seemed uh, to to give the Enlightenment idea its its proof. And so what you ended up having to do, is the the Catholic schools largely just aped the mainstream schools, and that's where we left off. Near Mal, I wanted to talk a lot about the because um, most of our talk is going to be about the liturgy as being a cure to this, um, the distortions of the Cold War and how that changed. Is, is there anything in the first part of the twentieth century? There's obviously a lot. Is there anything in particular you want to bring up as to how modernity developed and to how that might have distorted um, both the population in general? and uh, the Catholic people. For sure. I think uh, what we have, what we should uh, be mindful in this is um, the, per the prevalence, um, uh, overall overwhelming prevalence, um, as the new century dawns, as the early 1900s uh, begins, um, prevalence of this uh, idea, or uh, I guess mindset, of extreme skepticism. Um, and this idea of skepticism, I think, is something that is going to be fundamental to describing the 20th century, i.e., I don't know what's out there. I can only access what I can with my own abilities, and therefore, um, you know, I can only know about things that I know about, and the rest I don't know about. Um, so this idea of extreme individualism. Um, where things are so tied up with our own uh, abilities, where nothing uh, outside of our own abilities is allowed to exist, is a fundamental, I think, problem. And this is goes back, I guess, uh, earlier, but it gets pronounced in the 20th century, 
this idea of the rejection of the transcendent, i.e. the church and state become so far separated that you also then have the separation of Christ and the individual, mm. where, you know, the, the two then, be, you know, become internal, that, that separation becomes internalized, right? And that internalization then separates the faithful from the faith. And then, of course, in the vacuum that is created in the separation, you have the immediate, I would say, growth of atheism and agnosticism. Um, which become very fundamental um, and, I guess, very pervasive forces in the 20th century. Um, so this is how I would categorize things if I were to, uh, you know, do it quickly. Yes, and you know, in the in the soil here of Connecticut rests the bones of Wallace Stevens, a uh, um, modernist poet, and uh, perhaps, depending on who you listen to, a, a convert to the church, or perhaps not, but in any case, um, he has a poem where I think you talk about, you know, you mentioned this, this modern skepticism and, you know, if, if the 20th century is good for, for anything, it's, um, they're very good at meditating on the, on the despair of the human condition, sometimes very, very honestly. And um, I remember in one of Stephen's poems, I believe it's Sunday morning. I believe it's Sunday morning. Um, which is a short poem that's that's worth looking into. But he talks about there or elsewhere, it might be in his collection of essays. I wish, he says, I wish I could believe in a sacred grove anymore. I wish I had that mindset. Exactly. And um, I think uh, that is pervasive in all of the literature of, of modernism, as they say. You know, uh, James Joyce, very famously, you know, um, what is he writing about in those two vast books that he writes, you know, uh, Finnegan's Wake, uh, for example, more than um, uh, 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 what is he writing about in Finnegan's Wake? He's writing about the liturgy and his fight with liturgy and his rejection of liturgy. Um, and it's that uh, process of rejecting, you know, uh, the, the, I guess, meaning, uh, the reje rejection of what um, once described inner life and the mind, uh, or what, you know, uh, Bruno Stell might call the discovery of the mind, the rejection of the rediscovery of the mind. Um, that's what all these modernists are doing. So if you look at modernism, uh, modernist literature as a whole, um, you know, um, perhaps even in including Yeats, uh, even though he's a bit, you know, outside that, you know, parameter time-wise. Um, but all these people are struggling with that notion. <clears throat> what is the best way? This is their struggle, or this is their question, or their quest. What is the best way to reject Christianity? This is what they're talking about again and again and again. Uh, and it appears in different forms for these people. For James Joyce, it's the rejection of, of liturgy completely uh, and replaced by his own... Um, mythologized version of knowledge where um, the purpose of you know life is just acquisition acquiring as much learning as possible and so forth and that's all it it is just so you can have a good conversation at the end of the day over a nice glass of wine um, that's what these guys are, are talking about um, Hemingway is doing the same thing he's rejecting uh, you know through uh, through his um, you know uh, through his various novels Short stories, not so much, but through his various novels, he's rejecting uh, the fundamental Protestant traditions of uh, of uh, what the world is and how it's configured and so forth. Um, and we can go down the list of all these characters, you know. Um, uh, but um, the point is that they're involved in this uh, in this entire process of rejection. Um, so skepticism in the 20th century, I'm suggesting, I would like to suggest leads to this uh, habit of mind of rejecting authority or what now is known in the, at universities as norm criticism where anything and everything that's normal has to be criticized because it's wrong um, and therefore we need to by rejecting and criticizing and de uh, destroying the normal we bring in the new uh, we bring in something better that i think is is the entire um, quest the 
agenda, program, project uh, of modernity, of modernism of the 20th century. And of course, we're recipients of that in the 21st. I'm hoping we will change it. Um, but um, that I think is 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 the fundamental um, the fundamental parameters of where modernism is going and where it has led us in the 20th century. And with that uh, progression, you have some some terrible blowups, quite literally, in those those world wars, such abuses of of human rights and so forth. <clears throat> And it, it almost feeds, there's this cycle of, as despair does, right? It, it fe whether that's an individual or a community. I think Yeats has that poem, I, I forget the um, the title of it, but um, you know, he, one of the lines is modern women, he's talking about Kul Cohen, modern women don't bear such men anymore. Yeah. And yeah. it is interesting um, in the ancient mythologies to, to take that topic and compare it to, you know, modernity in the early 20th, mid 20th century. It is an interesting observation that the peoples of the world, you know, historically, they trace their ancestor back to some jacked bodybuilder or to some, um, you know, some voluptuous woman or, you know, this sort of thing. And what does modern man trace his origin back to? But, but you know, slime and protoplasm. And that's his mythology. And or chaos. Chaos. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's there. There is this despair you hear in Yeats or so forth. Modern women can't can't bear those type of men anymore. He's and, got, and, you know, there's another brilliant. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, uh, Yeats has another really brilliant um, um, uh, poem in, in memory of uh, of uh, Eva Gore Booth and Con Mark Markiewicz. Um, and these are two revolutionary women uh, that he knew. Um, uh, and he says, both beautiful, one a gazelle, one was really beautiful, apparently. Uh, but anyway, um, now he approaches them as old women, and he's visiting them again. Um, and they're shriveled up, and they're all that sort of thing, single, of course, no children, nothing, everything dedicated to the revolution. Um, and he says, um, they've become an image of their politics. Mm. Yeah. That I think is a very powerful description of modernity, that we've all become an image, uh, a reflection. I think I'm misquoting him, but I think it's a reflection. Uh, maybe it's a reflection or image, but anyway, one of the two, reflection image of their politics. So you have this idea then of a uh, very interesting one um, that once faith is removed, the vacuum is filled with politics and notice this is what we're all concerned with all the time every thing that we are engaged in is some kind of a political action uh where even education has become political activism that's what education is you know uh, you want to make the world better yes i mean it's that this early 20th century you have the popularization of, of john dewey in these united states <laughs> interesting is i in in my podcast for months uh, this past winter i was you know ruminating over why he's considered the father of, of at least american education when so few of his ideas have actually been implemented but the one that i i discerned actually was implemented um was i suppose an outgrowth of, of pragmatism and that's his utilitarianism, the idea that and I one of the just in fact, the justification for an idea is if it's popular and if it's if it's practical. And so any idea and I was well, I was wondering that in regards to Dewey, I was also wondering it also into just the <coughs> movement that had on just this generation's inability to actually reform itself. And, and that would also include church, you know, pious people as well why everyone's such a mess. And I think part of it is we've all deeply drunk from Dewey's stream of utilitarianism that if it see, and I come across people all the time, whether it's education or whatever, well, what can you do? This is the world. This is how the world is. And this is the, the flowering of that type of thinking. Well, th what can you do? This is the way it is. And, you know, this links up actually very nicely with our discussion. Uh, in that this idea that that you mentioned about uh, is you know about and with Dewey, this idea comes from um, uh, another interesting fellow that you've mentioned as well um, in our communication, 
and that's um, uh, Robert Lamine, uh, you know, uh, Robert Felicite Lamine, um, the erstwhile priest. Um, and what, how does uh, how well, how did he describe um, um, uh, faith or religion? He says um, the most successful faith is that which has the most adherence. Um, so this is how you judge a good religion uh, by its numbers. Um, and that is exactly Dewey. That is exactly modernist thinking. What can you do? Yeah, they all think this way, so it must be that way. Um, so it's it's a very um, 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 fatal approach, uh, a very fatal influence um, that we can, of course, again trace uh, genealogically, uh, and it can be gone. We can go, we can take it back to um, Robert um, or Robert Lamine, uh, uh, or more importantly, to to this tradition of Romanticism, um, and what we were talking about earlier with the rejection of of Revelation, and in its place uh, we bring in intuition. Uh, which is what romanticism is all about, uh, the rejection of everything but emotion. Uh, so what we have left are simply emotional responses to reality. That's all we have, you know. Uh, so what can you do? Nothing. <laughs> uh, why? Because our fundamental origin is chaos, which is nothing. Right? Mm. Uh, this is moral. <laughs> and, you know, as we move along here, you know, I, I when I come across different groups, uh, whether that's uh, all sorts of groups that I, I have disagreements with over the past 200 years, you know, there is a, an empathetic or, 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 or pathetic response I have because what you have is a Western in, somewhat integral or at least trying to be integral society where everything's interrelated with this Christian schema, which can do so. And then it's smashed by the businessmen, by the occultists, and by by the statists in the late um, 18th century. And, and this is why I, I try to at least have a pathos for various groups, because it's almost as if all of us in the West are, you know, we've been shattered. This, this unity is shattered. We're all chasing whether it's politics or religion or, um, or art for art's sake, is, is that we're all... All of us are in the wake of that shattering that happened 200 years ago. Or earlier, I would suggest. Um, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the Reformation. Uh, yeah, it is, the, it is the pursuit of the lost Christendom. We lost yeah. Christendom. We completely lost it because it was destroyed, shattered, annihilated, etc. And we don't know how to bring it back together again. Uh, it's right. coming so down to... The you know, lady <laughs> her fist is, is trying, to, yeah, trying yeah. to recover that. Exactly. Hence the revolutions, hence the utopias, uh, which are dystopias, um, et cetera, et cetera. They're all this effort to regain, um, you know, uh, the Garden of Eden uh, that we imagine uh, our lives should inhabit, but we don't know how to bring it about. Um, and our efforts are always inadequate and meager uh, because we can't do anything. <clears throat> hence our trust in politics, in God forbid, politicians uh, and their schemes uh, and so forth in big money, in capitalism. Um, so we are faithless people looking for a faith. And we put our faith, therefore, in all kinds of things that, we, that are unimaginable even. Uh, and we put our faith in those things because somehow we think those are going to save us. So the process of salvation still haunts our minds. But we've lost the, the truth of what that salvation is. And because we've lost it, we're trying to reimagine, reinvent, refurbish um, whatever we can because of what we've been given. And that what we've been given as our inheritance is simply an empty individualism, right? Yeah. You can do anything you want, <laughs> which is emptiness. And as we, we progress in our chronology towards, you know, this late 20th century um, uh, mindset, which, which certainly comes into its own and, and whatnot, uh, continuing with our chronology, I wanted to bring up two uh, points as we're moving uh, towards the Cold War, and then we can bring this to the liturgy in particular and uh, the medicine that can bring. 
But uh, two, you know, in the context of the Great Depressions, in the context of that great word, I hope we all look up from Dr. Das, that is cameralism. And the, the ultimately, whether it's Marxist or, you know, this the commercial mindset is moving forward, ultimately. With the World Wars, I do want to bring up two points that are very um, uh, pressing into our discussion of why um, Western Christendom ends up so ham-fisted, so anti-intellectual. And one of them is the fact that you have this ghetto mindset, which has existed, for, you know, at this point, maybe by 100, 150 years, um, with maybe with intelligence. I'm not, you know, there, there are reasons for that, you know, marry within the faith, don't read, don't read heretical books and so forth. But it also creates a population by the mid 20th century, which literally cannot think in, or even interact with the larger world. And uh, so you have that aspect, which is a very dangerous aspect in 20 years time by the mid to late 60s, when all of those same people are told go out into the world and tear down that ghetto. You have that dangerous reality, but you also have um, a dynamic which isn't covered as much, which is during the 20s, 30s and 40s. I'm sure, Nirmal, you've heard this, right? Vocations were so great during that time, right? Right. Okay, what else was going on in in the twenties, thirties, and forties? The what crash of the depression. <laughs> the depression and the and the second and first world wars. That's why there were so many vocations. It wasn't because things were just a great time. It was because if you went to a monastery, you didn't have to go and fight on in, in D Day. Exactly. exactly. And so. You, and I, I really honestly wish that will be brought up in traditionalist writing because that seems to be completely forgotten in this in this discussion of why things are. You have all these people going into seminaries and religious houses that are just trying to get off the breadline. Exactly. They're just trying to get off the battlefield. And exactly. that's also why when those those problems like the Depression and the World Wars go away, that's also partially one of the reasons for the drop off. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And let's not also forget that these wars are industrialized. These are expressions of industrialism as well. These aren't, <clears throat> you know, knights on horseback slashing away at somebody and then trying to kill them and maybe not succeeding. This is industrialized slaughter, like serious slaughter of humanity. And that, I think, is another aspect of it, that industrialism pervades killing. Like, uh, modern politics becomes industrialized killing as well that's one of his expressions so um you know when we're talking about um uh, when we're talking about what's going on in this time we're also talking about a very weaponized concept of politics uh politics is no longer simply you know running the country or managing things it's about industrialized slaughter where you know countries can agree to go to war and then it is serious war it's like slaughter. people millions die um because of that decision so we're talking about a very bizarre kind of disconnect for the individual from reality um where individual decisions like your x on a vote means slaughter of 50 million or 100 million because the government you elected decides to go to war um, or not go to war, etc. And also as part of that, um, and we touched on this the last episode near Mal, and um, if anyone's interested in this topic, I've done interviews with actually a, a fellow Canadian um, uh, but who goes by the name Christian Remedy in Law, Christian name Daniel, in Canada. And also Clint Richardson here in these United States. And if you want to get into the really occult aspect of the present system, I, I suggest you check out those interviews on my um, channel. But in any case, um, part of the reason and the justification for the industrial slaughter is the fact that modern citizens are office holders within the state. It's basically the last office. <laughs> it's the most worthless office. But it is an, you are part of the government. So when an Al Qaeda guy goes into your your um, grocery store and blows himself up, he's not he's not lying when he says you are a legitimate target because you are an office holder. Or when 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 uh, Roosevelt drops a, a firebomb on your city, you are an office holder. Exactly. Exactly. And they're thick thinking. This is what they're thinking. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because the two, the, all the systems are connected. Uh, if we're talking about systems, uh, this is the this is the 
the bold experiment of modernity in which it succeeded, uh, you know, extravagantly, where systematized, where things were so systematized, not integrated, mind you, but systematized in such a way uh, that everyone works towards one cause or one end. Uh, why I don't think it's integration is because integration means agreement, uh, where uh, you know people agree to do things. Here we don't agree to most of these things, and yet we do them. Uh, we do not agree to abortions, and yet we elect all governments that do carry out abortion, and it's legal. Uh, it's it's a it's a human right apparently uh, to kill you know uh, little children. Um, so this idea <clears throat> of agreement is also part and uh, part of the problem i.e. there's an assumption that you're all part of the corporate system. Uh, let's not forget our cities are incorporated, right? They're incorporated <laughs> entities. <laughs> They're not <laughs> cities. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and yeah, absolutely. This this whole thing is that's the name of the game. It's the name of corporation. Even that name, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but even no, that, yeah. name, that legal so they, name is part of this of the state. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, in order to tear us our, tear ourselves away from this uh, corporation, uh, this complex, uh, is not going to be an easy thing. No, no I hate to rant about it uh, because it is so. It has so permeated our lives in such a deep and um, effective way uh, that to tear ourselves away means the development of another. Um, culture, another civilization. This is why, for example, I think you or your institution as well and the apostle are about rebuilding Christendom. We do not want this corporation mode. <laughs> we don't want this system. It has led us to slaughter and mayhem and whatnot and cruelty, unimaginable cruelties. We don't want it. Nirmal, between the uh, the atom bomb and these horrible uh, wars of the 20th century, and now when we fast forward uh, 80 years or so to we're all sitting in our house, commerce has been shut down, so I have no point to exist right now. Um, before we turn to the liturgies, are any are there any other major milestones um, that can um, light our way? So, and just to recap for the viewers, what we've laid out over two shows is both the dis dissolution of the general society based off of the principles that we've laid out, but also, and this is a, a topic um, um, that we've also followed, is the increasing um, ham-fistedness, the increasing um, stultified nature of Christianity itself. I'm, I'm talking observant, orthodox, pious Christianity is a shadow of its previous self right now too. Uh, one thing I think I forgot we forgot to mention, I would like to uh, mention it, uh, aside from cameralism, I'd like to throw out another term that people should be aware of, and that's uh, Josephinism. Mm. Uh, and this is with, um, uh, you know, the Emperor Joseph II uh, in the 18th century, um, in which um, governments, well, he formulates this notion, it's now pervasive, where it's the job of the government uh, to make sure that we are always pursuing progressive policies, i.e. we're always moving forward, moving forward, getting better, uh, and so forth. So <clears throat> anything that hinders progress is bad. That is one of the things we should also bring to mind uh, when we're talking about um, where we are at. So it's also the triumph of Josephinism. Um, and the triumph of Joseph, Josephinism has meant all these sorts of things. So that was a little component, I think, that we missed in our discussion, which I would like to point to, uh, because a very important component, because this is what we think governments are all about, to make our lives better, you know, and they do all kinds of things to keep making us better, uh, including, you know, keep on keeping us alive by mass house arrest, you know, and uh, that we're experiencing today, uh, where we all have to sit inside uh, and not go out so that we don't get killed. Um, you know, I, many people who go along with this, the fellow travelers and whatnot, and the true believers, and they always say, you know, when it, with this coronavirus thing, it's for our own good, you know. And that phrase, this is for our own good, uh, I think is the most telling of all of where we're at, you know, that we will oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Nirmal, as we turn towards not just laying out 
the problems and the unimpressive modern culture. And by the way, just as an experiment, if you want to see the what this culture produces, go to a modern funeral and just hear the, the background talk. I mean, there I, I was at a, a recent um, funeral in a church and just to hear the, the coffee talk afterwards, you want to talk about just the the disaster of modern thinking, a modern philosophy. It is, and these were the people there for the funeral <laughs> man. <laughs> it, it, it was something else. But I know. Um, I know. We, go on, yeah. It's very sad. I know, I know. Um, and I think uh, what we're really discussing or what we really are grappling with is the unimaginable emptiness that this all is. You know, and what fascinates me or what I guess astonishes me is that how come people don't see it why is it that no one sees this emptiness is emptiness so comforting <laughs> or so desirable that they don't see it they don't they think this is a good life this is great and i want more of it uh, it's bizarre that uh, I know, it, it confounds me i don't know how to answer that or, or address it you know where where we're at that way like uh, people are happy happy with being empty well, you know, for all of those who are or have been uh, cooped up in their rooms listening to Bill Gates talk to them in their <laughs> in their deracinated apartment uh, that they have to pay, uh, you know, however many hundreds of dollars a month on, we have a solution for you. We have a solution for the work that lays ahead, and that is the Holy Liturgy. So, Nir Mal, what do we mean by the Holy Liturgy? We just laid out two, three, four hundred years of mess. We're, we have arms, we have backs, we have work to do. What is the liturgy? Let's start there. Let's start with there. Okay, good. Um, liturgy, um, in a very basic layman's term, is um, the return to um, this idea that our lives have purpose beyond uh, addressing daily you know, needs, um, i.e. food and the pursuit of money and all that sort of thing. Um, and what the liturgy does, of course, is that it's a constant reminder that our lives have purpose, which is eternal. Um, and we can get into the nitty gritty of the liturgy later. Uh, but the point of all of this stuff, what that we, you know, that uh, this makes us uh, do, um, the prayers and so forth, and the meditation and the readings and so forth, and the mass, of course, as well. What it does is that it's a constant reminder or a continuing reminder that this is not what this is all about. Life is not simply the pursuit of X, Y, or Z, or Z. Um, it's actually uh, the pursuit of something greater, i.e. that we have a greater destiny than simply this. So, and I think for me, more importantly, it's a reminder <clears throat> that life is not the pursuit of utopias. I think that is really um, uh, the hallmark of this, that the purpose of daily life is an engagement with eternity. And if we understand how to engage with eternity or the transcendent, those concepts that have been totally robbed from our minds and are from, from our experiences, <clears throat> those concepts that have been robbed from, if we can focus on those things, if we can focus on the eternity, if we can focus on what is, um, required for us to live a beautiful life as opposed to a wealthy life or a rich life even, but a beautiful life. Uh, I think that is where uh, um, the ultimate purpose and the intent and the, and the greatness of liturgy is in that our life can be beautiful. And if we pursue the beautiful, well, here's a path, here's a way to do it. And it's then the process of pursuing the beautiful which we can then define as the good or salvation and Christ and God and the faith and so forth. We can, there's all kinds of definition for that uh, end goal. So, <clears throat> you know, very briefly, um, again, you know, as a, as a, this is the panoramic view, this is the, you know, the aerial view. Um, liturgy becomes that process uh, through which we become complete. Um, where we, where emptiness is filled that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when we talk about that specifically, we're of course talking about uh, the Holy Mass, but also the hours of the office, as well as the other sacramental ceremonies.
I think in the West, this is also, I think, very much a legacy of the 19th and 20th centuries. We tend to think of the liturgy just as the mass. Um, but it's, it's a much broader thing that touches so many aspects of life. And Nirmal, I was thinking as we see this, this hammer blow um, at some point in the past come to an integrated order, I thought we could um, take our, our pinnacle, our cherry on top comments to talk about the liturgy in regards to three areas which in a more sane age were, were united. So let me know what you think about um, go, taking this conversation, how the liturgy relates to time, how it relates to tangible physical connection to our, our environment, our lives, and then also very much a topic of the 19th and 20th centuries, how the liturgy can order our understanding of work. Good. Uh, those are great topics. Uh, when I just go down the list, I just take yeah, time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, how do you do that? So, uh, for the, the first one is time. Is time so one of the uh, bifurcations we see in modernity is the um, the most peculiar split between <clears throat> working time and a chilling an absolutely chilling cuss word. I, I I don't cuss too much, but sometimes I do. But um, I won't say this one. Uh, and and this term is free time. Uh, the kids in, in the, the previous uh, school that I worked at, the kids would always have fun with that because they would notice I wouldn't say certain terms like free time. <laughs> Leisure time, leisure time, and you can read or a play great time. Play time is another play word. time. Play time, yeah, yeah. And um, we we see this in the modern world: this split between the real world, which is working, and then free time. That's you know, I'm not doing anything. Then, whereas Joseph Pieper and other essayists, they point out it's actually the reverse. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, what I think. Here, the, what the liturgy reminds us in all of its, um, you know, fullness, uh, not just simply the mass. What it reminds us of is that um, our lives are dedicated to something other than simply, uh, like I said, the pursuit of money or cash or whatever. In other words, how is it that you acquire meaning? If your meaning is simply housed in acquisition, or what Plato would call the appetitive level, um, then you are basically leaving out a mega, you know, purpose of why you are breathing. Um, and that is that you have to pursue something meaningful. Plato calls it the good. Um, and that's what this is all about. So the pursuit of the good um, can be done in a certain way. And what the liturgy reminds us of is that the best way to pursue the good, which is are transcendent, which is God, which is salvation, and all that sort of thing. The best way to do this is to recognize that each of our moments, each of our lives, every aspect of our lives is related to the transcendent, is God given, is related to what uh, uh, is related to eternity. Um, and we have to align ourselves through ritual, through sacraments, through prayer through, uh, you know, uh, scriptural readings and so forth, um, to that eternity. And once we start aligning ourselves to that eternity, <clears throat> the consequences will be a good civilization. So we cannot pursue the good civilization first and then say, yeah, I'll be religious in my, you know, spare time or my play time or my free time. Um, no, that's not the point of it because you will not get either, you know. Um, it's Christ basically saying, you know, um, the purpose is to pursue the kingdom of God. And then all these things will be added to you, i.e. the good civilization, the good life, a bit of cash, a happiness, and all this sort of thing will come later as a consequence of holiness. So each of our lives, uh, sorry, each moment of our lives must be devoted in some way to holiness, to the pursuit of holiness. Um, so you have, for example, the Book of Hours, right? What was the point of all of that, right? Uh, I.e., each hour of each day was dedicated to holiness. The consequences of the pursuit of holiness was medieval civilization, by the way, mm. which is no nothing to laugh at, <clears throat> you know? We haven't built cathedrals like they did. 
for example. We can't. Mm. We cannot. We may try, but they come off bad. Why? Because we don't have the faith. Those are structures not simply of grand architecture, but they're expressions of medieval faith, mm -hmm. uh, medieval pursuit of holiness. So work, and this is why I would suggest always uh, if in our discussion, this is why you know I always mention in a previous, you know, whenever I talk about it with others, is I always mention the, the cathedral, <clears throat> the Gothic cathedral. That is what this is all about. It's all it's work, it's masonry, it's you know architecture, it's mathematics, it's all of that stuff. But that is not the end of it. It is art, it is all that, but that's not the point of it. The point is to uh, create a church, mm. right? It's the creation of faith, it's the establishment of faith. So work has a natural progression, of course, but the end of work is holiness. The end of uh, craft, art, is holiness. The end of education uh, is holiness. You know, it's, it's not the books there, Mal? It's not the, uh, the accounting books at the quarter? No, no, sorry to disappoint you, no. <laughs> right, so we have a fundamentally, a radically different understanding of work in the modern world compared to what you just said. Exactly, exactly. So work... Uh, and again, this is my cathedral, uh, you know, uh, 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 metaphor. Uh, the, the point was not, and those are all perfectly created, like chiseled stones and so forth. These are beautifully constructed things, and they're precise because they've been standing for hundreds of years. So it worked, whatever it was that they had. Uh, the science worked, let's put it that way. Uh, so they had the science, they had the technology, they had the craftsmanship, but they were not pursuits in themselves. I mean, look at, for example, our art installations, as we call them nowadays, you know? What is our art? It is nothing. It is simply an expression of our inner chaos. I don't know anything. I'm hopeless. I have nothing to offer you, but I'm going to fill up space, and they're going to give me a bit of cash for it, and that's why I'm doing it. There's no end. There is no... Um, um, end game let's put it this way to use you know Beckett uh, there's no end game here it's just simply regurgitation of tripe you know um, uh, well tripe you know, basically uh, <clears throat> but if we look at the cathedral that is liturgy that is the point of liturgy that is what liturgy is all about it's bringing together all our all of our abilities in order to construct something beautiful something holy, and therefore something that is greater than ourselves. Because as human beings, we all want to be bigger than ourselves, and we don't know how. Movies yeah. aren't going to do it. Sports are not going to do it. You know, stupid art is not going to do it, especially the modern art that they have. You know, It's not going to do it. It's not going to give you anything. It's just going to say, oh, that's interesting, and then we move on to something else that's interesting. Emptiness, emptiness, and emptiness. Um, whereas liturgy reminds us of something else so i've always uh, imagined liturgy to be like the cathedral so that's my you know little uh, uh metaphor for that for that approach and these aren't abstract ideas either you know in uh in hebrew saint paul says do not neglect the assembly as is the custom of some uh, but rather encourage each other as you see the day drawing near and you're on your own for the verse number, but I gave you the chapter there. So how do you like that? Uh, <laughs> but in that, you know, as, as Matt, as, as lame and as unimpressive as the uh, local churches may be, and that's a whole other discussion for another day. Um, but we ought to be, as we consider this reconstruction of society along proper order, that this is a practical thing. The, this idea of liturgy and and so forth is an absolute thing that we can introduce in our own lives, whether that means uh, going uh, and keeping Sunday proper or, you know, whatever that's going to mean for someone's life, saying one of the hours uh, in a week or a day or a month, that's going to depend on the person. But, you know, incorporate actually incorporating the actual ceremonies um, trying to get to some of the other um, aspects of the liturgy, if, if possible, the ordinations, baptisms, uh, and so forth. These things plug us in to things that were disconnected from funerals. How about that? People don't want to talk about death. 
um, or or birth or you know just life itself is um, is so deracinated and the liturgy um, these things are public ceremonies you, you, you don't need a, a RSVP or whatever you can go to them and these are just like we've lost this civilization by a battle of inches it's retaken by a battle of inches by every hour in the office and so forth exactly exactly and I think this is where uh, we have to realize that if we are going to be constructing um, a different mindset, as we talked about, uh, you know, a different mentality, that can only be done through a very particular way. Um, so don't look for, um, don't put your trust in in politics and politicians. Don't put your trust in culture and culture wars or whatever that thing is. Uh, don't put your you know uh, trust in uh, things that are. Um, going to somehow better this world, any kind of promises that do this, because all those are empty expressions of our emptiness. Um, what we need to do, of course, uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, is to plug ourselves back into that system that actually worked. You know, we've unplugged ourselves and now we're going around trying to find a plug that will work. Um, but we don't want the one that worked for some odd reason. And because we don't want that one that works, we're never going to be plugged into anything, hence the emptiness, hence, hence all of that stuff that we talked about. Um, so the only way to do, to do this properly um, is to, uh, to understand that um, when we're talking about uh, living, when we're talking about life, we're really talking about something very fundamental to human beings. And that is, um, you know, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? These are very fundamental questions to anybody alive today and before and, and from, you know, in the future. This is going to be the human <clears throat> problem to answer those two questions. And you will, you know, mark my word, there's very few, actually none, uh, that I know of answers in, in modernity, in the modern world for those two questions. Yes, there are ways to waste time. Yes, there's ways to even worse kill time, um, as we say. Um, but none of those will provide you meaning. Worse, none of them will give you a purpose, you know. And I think this idea of purposelessness is something that is a very horrible version of that emptiness we talked about. And what the liturgy does, or the reconnection, I should say, back to the church, what it does is that it provides us the energy, the, the purpose, uh, the point of why we live. And if we don't have that, of course, we don't live. Uh, we do all kinds of other things like kill time. Um, and that is all that is. Um, so it's a very sad, sad state of affairs, really, in that regard. You know, it's people running around with a plug don't know what to do with it don't know where to put it you know don't have no idea what to do with it and yet they need they know they need something <clears throat> everyone knows they need spirituality i hate that term but you know you might as well use it they need it they know they need it so you have diets you have veganism you have all these other expressions of spirituality but nothing really satisfies right and that, I think, is what this is all about. This is a hunger. Um, you know, man does not live by bread alone. This is what this is all about. Um, and that beautiful, um, you know, parable, uh, if you're the father, do you give your son a stone to eat when he asks for bread? You know, we are being given stones to eat when we are hungry <clears throat> and we need bread. Um, and unfortunately, we can't eat any of that stuff. So, um what does modernity offer? This is my question to, to anyone who, you know, hesitates uh, with this kind of approach. Uh, what does modernity offer that is so engrossing, that is so inviting <clears throat> that, you know, you don't need eternity. You are happy in the here and now. Um, and I don't get too many convincing answers, you know, from, about, about this. And I think as we set our, our back to, to, this, uh, to this work, um, you know, reviving liturgy, actually living it in our own our own uh, circumstances. 
Um, one of the things, and this is part of the ham-fistedness we, we need to be aware of, not just from uh, modernity, but also in, uh, uh, you know, amongst the pious, <coughs> is this is, liturgy is not just a personal act of devotion, and that if we really embrace the philosophy of it, we can very soon um, see its connection to the economic order, the practical out on the street economic order, the emotional order, our interpersonal order. And I would encourage, um, you know, those who are more devout and, and um, all of us who think we have our act together to really challenge ourselves that these are, you know, going to mass or the office or so forth are not just individual aspects. I think that's a distortion that has really done a lot of damage. For sure. Yeah. And it's a, that distortion, of course, is this idea of, uh, of liberty, of personal liberty. We misunderstand what liberty is, <clears throat> and because we understand mis misunderstand liberty, we express that misunderstanding in various ways. So this is, you know, this reconnection uh, via liturgy is not for personal satisfaction as such, but it also has consequences greater than ourselves. Like you said, it's the reconstruction of Christendom. It's the reconstruction of that civilization that we all want, that we all talk about, uh, you know, that we all desire. Uh, it's the rehabilitation of money back into its moral order. Money is not, money is meaningless without morality. <clears throat> this is the, one of the biggest heresies of our time, you know, where we've detached money from all moral consequences. And because we've done that, all things are possible, of course, um, you know, to quote, to, Misquote Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky, <laughs> uh, here we go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> so we have to reconnect. So the point is that all these things can be obtained, but not in the way that we're pursuing them to attain them. You know, we cannot attain them if we have emptiness inside. We cannot construct the good world that we all want to live in when we ourselves are totally empty, <clears throat> when we don't know what to do with ourselves, you know, other than kill time, uh, this is the problem. So it, exactly, so, so when we reconnect or pursue meaning within the structure of the liturgy, what we are doing is that we are acquiring um, or we're fitting ourselves for the higher tasks. So the mason cutting the stone for the cathedral is not seeing the completed version. He's only seeing his blocks of stone and he's trying to make them as perfectly as possible and then fitting them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's his liturgy. Let's, you know, that's to, you know, push the metaphor a bit, you know? That is what his liturgy is, to make a good piece of stone, perfectly hewn, perfectly chiseled, so it fits beautifully into the wall or the flying buttress or whatever. Um, but he doesn't see the complete picture yet. He doesn't see the complete cathedral because it may be 100, 200 years away. You know, these things took time to create some of them, um, not all of them, uh, but it took, it takes time. <clears throat> so by reconnecting to the liturgy, we are becoming masons in that regard. We are becoming those masons that are now going to be carefully hewing the stone ourselves uh, in order to construct <clears throat> that building, that edifice that we don't see yet ourselves yet, but it will be the consequence of our effort today. But if we don't become skilled masons, nothing's going to happen. There's not going to be any cathedral to look at because we have no idea how to build it because we don't know how to construct it. We don't, we're not masons. So by reconnecting to liturgy, by reconnecting to the church, we are becoming workers in the proper sense, you know, not workers in the capitalist sense. Uh, we are working, we are working for another purpose, i.e. the building of the cathedral, which is for our per intents and purposes, that civilization that we all want, we all desire, and we don't know how to get because it somehow eludes our efforts. We put our trust in politicians and they need us somewhere else. Uh, we put our trust in you know, ideologies and they lead us somewhere else. Um, they don't build anything. Rather, actually, they build dystopias. That's what they do. You know, they create all kinds of dystopias. But <clears throat> how much better it is to become the good mason, you know? 
that is what this is all about. Good, and I think that's a good place to uh, to put a bow on it. We're coming up on an hour and a quarter of this great uh, second half of our discussion on uh, modernity, on also the um, the distortions amongst the faithful at the same time because of constantly being under stress, and then also for both communities, how the liturgy properly understood can can bring about a, a really a reintegration. That's what we're after here. Exactly, and and a rebuilding. You know, a rebuilding, which is what is badly needed at this time. Well, near Mel, one place once once people are through with uh, with church, one place they can go to to find out about this rebuilding is the postal. So, tell us a bit about the postal and uh, where uh, your website. Yes, the postal you, you can reach any time. Uh, it's the postal dot com. Uh, P o s t i l dot com. Uh, the don't forget the the. Um, and um, yeah, you'll find all kinds of inter very interesting topics there discussed. Um, and one of the things that we'd like to uh, uh, stress about the postal is that it's about the long form. Uh, we actually have articles that are lengthy, uh, not little short little thingies, you know, that you always see um, that are all over the internet. But these are really hefty, long uh, discussions and pursuit of ideas, which is very important nowadays, because often in our haste, in our world that is full of haste, People want just talking points and then just read headlines and move on. No, no we're really about getting into the, the the meat of the matter and get really getting into the nitty gritty. So yes, uh, you know, if you're looking for you know some really interesting discussions, uh, do drop by uh, the boss, the postal .com. Great. And if you're in the market for a college education, you can go to a buckusdastasisinstitute.wordpress.com to find out about my work. But it is, uh, whether it's liturgy or reading on their mouth site and doing some deep research or learning here in Connecticut, this is a battle of inches. This mess got made that way, and it will be unmade that way. And it, it's for the long haul. So if you don't have a back for it, then uh, you probably should get back to listen to Bill Gates and your Netflix account. Exactly. Anyway, thanks, everyone, for watching. On your mouth, please stay on. Thank you. Um, and... Um, uh, please send us your correspondence to Christian History and Ideas at gmail.com or in the comments on this bit shoot or YouTube posting. Your mail, take care. Thank you. Take care, John. See you later.